Welcome to Generations, a show which helps people 50 and better lead happy, healthy, and productive lives. Here's Jeff DeZeller. Hello, and welcome to Generations. My name is Jeff DeZeller, and I'll be your moderator today. Joining me are my co-hosts, Ed Noreen, uh, the one and only. Hello, Ed. Good to see you. Oh, I'm excited. I, I, I am an artist myself, but I'm not an oil painter, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Sounds good. And Nadia Giordana. Hello, Nadia. Great to see you as always. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you, and it's fun to be here again today. There you go. And Midge Bubani, um, noted novelist. Uh, great to see you, Midge, as always. Good to see you. I'm very pleased to be here today. Okay. And last but not least, our guest, uh, oil painter Carlton McCambridge, um, is joining us. We're very excited to have you here today, Carly. Thanks, Jeff. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, okay. With that, let's uh, get started. Um, Carly, uh, you're an oil painter, and um, basically your bio indicated you've loved art your whole life, but didn't really seriously take up painting until you were um, near retirement. Could you maybe describe that evolution to us a little bit? Well, thanks a lot. Um, yes, I've, as far back as I can remember, I've been fascinated with art. Um, I grew up in Old Edina in the early 1950s, just a couple blocks away from the Minnehaha Creek. And um, I always said I had two feet in the Minnehaha Creek and my eyes on the surrounding beauty. My mom observed me drawing pictures of the dogs that would sleep on the couch. And she put me in piano lessons and oil painting lessons at 50th and France. And back then, the 15 women would be in the basement of the frame shop. There were only two children, myself and Liz Moore Levine. And the smell of turpentine that everyone used back then was intoxicating. But I, I liked that very much. After that, the, the nuns, of course, had us drawing all the time. And there was no art instruction. But they'd bring out their little suitcase with the LP record and play uh, Tchaikovsky or Grand Canyon Suite and make us draw. And th there was uh, a connection between art and music that I never lost. My story then goes all the way to 1972. I had come back to Minnesota from college in Arizona. And I had two majors. It was my junior year. And I was, uh, my majors were economics and art history. And my father every week would ask me, what are you going to do? And every week I'd say, I don't know. <laughs> so I was distraught about it. And I sought out a counselor. And uh, he gave me a test that would give me a career path. And uh, two days later, I came back, back to see him. And he said, oh, this is amazing. And I said, what is it? And he said, uh, well, the results show that you should be living on a mountaintop in Colorado in a teepee creating jewelry. <laughs> and I remember standing up and throwing down the papers and saying, oh, great. What good are you? I said, poor, the poor fellow. And I walked out of there. Um, I did graduate a year later with those two majors. And uh, the Art Institute wasn't interested in me because every application they had were doctorate, people from around the world. And I went right over to the University of Minnesota Hospitals and got a job quick. And I became an equipment tech for the next 34 years. <laughs> now, it wasn't very technical, but it afforded me a chance to be a part of a team and see what happens in a huge hospital. When it came time to finally uh, to receive the formula that they had for receiving a pension, I retired pretty early at the age of 56. Mm -hmm. Before that, in 1998, my mother contracted leukemia. She was a sculptor herself. And I took off three months of work, and I went to live with her and care for her. And when I finally got home after that terrible tragedy, and I was just emotionally drained, my wonderful wife, Liz, put me on the couch and looked at me and said, you are three fries short of a happy meal. <laughs> and I have bought you classes at the Minnesota River School of Art. Now, that was Pat Jurdy's beautiful school out in Burnsville. And her corral of teachers included teachers who had graduated from the Atelier Lac and a few illustrators who had turned into fine artists. And so for the next six years, I took classes there and then followed those artists wherever they went and went to other art artists. 
So that was the beginning of my education. It's been quite a journey then getting to that point. During the, your years when you were working the, as, a, as, the, as the equipment tech, mm -hmm. did you ever have time to dabble in your art or was it completely put aside during those years? Well, thank you for that question. I, I did acrylic paintings, but I didn't really care for acrylic. Um, some painters are great in it. Um, and I went down to four days a week so that I could spend more time going to classes and that helped with the stress level. Uh, the stress levels became high in the hospital, especially after a corporation took over. And I remember saying to one of the employees, get out. And he said, what? And I said, there's a river outside. I don't want to see you for a half an hour until you can come back and tell me that you have seen something beautiful. And he did. <laughs> so um, the idea that, that nature has a healing effect um, was something that I always felt. And I looked forward to the day that Liz and I could move to Montana, which we did. I uh, had, had knew a man who had studied architecture with Frank Lloyd Wright out in, uh, outside of Phoenix. And he was taking photographs of the sun. And Frank Lloyd Wright showed up. And he said, why don't you put the camera down and let's just sit here and look at the sunset. Mm. Mm. The power of nature. Mm. And it's, it's the serenity of nature, the oneness of, with the universe, and that's what I hear coming out of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the irony, Ed, of my story is that 53 years after I took that test, and the man said I should be living on a mountain in Colorado, I, uh, we bought land in Montana. I designed a home that we built 10 years ago, and we've had seven to eight great years out there. And I have a teepee in the front yard, and uh, the wildlife is ubiquitous, especially the raptors. And there isn't a night that goes by that we don't sit on the swing and look at the mountains. And I use the word beautiful 50 times a night. Yes. No, it really it's wasn't that far off, was no. it? No. Are you isn't making the jewelry? No. <laughs> no, I'm creating paintings in a beautiful art studio. And yet I'm moving to Colorado just no. to fulfill the prophecy. Montana is terrific. Mm. Uh, Montana is the uh, home for cowboys and Indians and reenactors and all kinds of characters. And if you look around out there, you clearly can see the Old West around you. So a, a lot of my portraits and the people that I paint come from that. So you Where's focus it? mostly on your Montana life with your art. Do you ever do anything? Well, when I come back Minnesota? here, thank you. When I come back here, I often do more city type art, dancers or religious art or mm -hmm. Christmas art. and. Uh, so when I'm out there, it's, it's more rodeo and uh, Victoria, they have Victorian balls twice a year and they dress up and, and the band plays music only from 1860. And uh, it's a magical place. You Hi. live in Bozeman. You live outside of Bozeman, yes, which uh, is really hour, special. Yeah, an hour southwest of Bozeman, yeah. north of Yellowstone Park. Mm -hmm. uh, our home is bordered by three majestic uh, mountain ranges. Mm -hmm. And uh, you never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, moose walk by the yard a couple times a year. It's a marvelous place. And they look different at different times of the day, don't they? The moose? The mountains. Oh, the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mountains, I've always said, uh, are sculpture. Mm -hmm. And if I walk over to the neighbor's yard, the mountains look different. Mm -hmm. And as the light changes, it's just terrific. I love oil painting. This is two-dimensional. But if I didn't do that, I'd try to be a sculpt sculptor. Do you do mostly portraits, or do you do some landscapes without the animals? And the yes, yes, and, and I have a painted right off my front porch. Now, the, the, the big push um, the last few years has been the love of plein air painting. And uh, you learn most, and I learned most through all my classes, from painting from life, still lives, figure lives, portrait lives. Um, which let me then go later on to photographs and this and that and, and, and try to do the best job I could. But that's, that's not a good way to do it. Um, uh, I love to do portraits. And portraits are a very intimate thing. Um, I, I, I almost kind of like make love to the person when I do it and, and, and take that in the right way because you observe and you look and the more you look, the more you see. And, uh, after a person starts doing a bunch of still life classes and portrait classes, you st finally start seeing like an artist. 
And by that I mean you see the nuances of temperature change and, and shapes of the face and shadows. Mm -hmm. And uh, so seeing like an artist is one of the great benefits of studying art. Keen observation. Yes, yes. What one teacher used to say, uh, my first teacher said, see it, mix it, paint it. And he said, well, what's the important one? And everyone was quiet, and I jumped up and yelled, see it. If you don't see it, you can't mix it, and you can't paint it. So that's been enriching. Uh, now my wife sees like an artist, too, just because of me. <laughs> so uh, for the portraits, um, Carly, do, do they sit for you um, as, you know, an, uh, you would see a person in an artist's studio day after day sitting there, or do you go from photographs, or do you have a combination of the two, or? Well, in the olden days, of course, that's what they did. Um, and, but I, uh, I've taken enough courses in, in portraiture class. I remember taking with Carolyn Anderson a few years ago, and, and for that week we had three uh, sitters per day. Um, but, and I used to also then snap a photograph and, and look back at the photograph. Um, but I, I was painting and happened to be next to the great painter out west, uh, Jim Wilcox in Wyoming. And he would do uh, color studies with the Tetons and then he'd come back to the studio and with a photograph on a big computer screen there. And I went, oh, that's it. And so I've been painting from a big con computer screen that I have and it's, it's a lot better than a photograph. So, but uh, to answer your question, um, the best thing to do is to paint from life, and the way to improve is to paint for life. And so I need to do more of that. Carly, I used to be a professional model. I'll model for you. <laughs> <laughs> no nudes, though. Okay. You know, this this right. body has to be covered at all times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. <laughs> One thing I noticed is uh, that you mentioned uh, on your website is my art does not shock or challenge. Instead, it is a manifestation of my appreciation of the creator's gifts. And I mm. see that in no. your artwork. Thank you. There, there was a young man who I saw at a party and he had graduated from an art school. And he said what I did was not art. And when I said, why do you say that? He said, um, what you have done is, has been done before. And I said, yes, it has, and a lot better. You know, I laughed. And I asked him what his definition of art was. And after talking to him, I found out that he th thought that art should be more innovative and challenging. And I said to him, I, I don't want to challenge the viewer. I want to transcend the viewer to a place of peace, uh, 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 which is an essential part of humanness, I think. Um, and uh, th this world is in turmoil right now. And my, the way I paint uh, is, a re is my reaction to the few hardships and pain that I've seen in my life. And it's a healing thing. So that's how I feel about it that. It really is, and you can see it in the art. Mm -hmm. you, you had mentioned um, Andrew Wyeth. And he's one of my favorite painters mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. And I could mm -hmm. see uh, his uh, influence in some of your work. Well, um, besides drawing the dogs when I was young, I recopied all the illustrations in my children's book. But my mother's Scribner classics just meant the world to me. And I still look at them. N.C. Wyeth was my hero. And uh, Howard Pyle, the Brandywine School, the golden age of illustrators. And uh, quite often, they would have these big horizon clouds in the background. And in some of my paintings, maybe not these you see, but I, ha I have these big horizon clouds. Uh, I did a series on uh, Joan of Arc. And mm -hmm. there were the horizon clouds. And, uh, it, uh, and, and like uh, N.C. Wyeth, who was a great painter, um, looking at my art, th it's pretty simple. I have one subject, one message. And, uh, and I want people to see that right away. But, and yet, I want there to be a hint of narrative. I want them to be captured by it and wonder what's going on there. I, I, I love the, the idea of storytelling, going back to N.C. Wyeth. Um, uh, every child loves a story. Before they go to bed universally, they might say, tell me a story. Jesus told parables to convey his message. And uh, I just think at this, this particular time, if you want art in your home, uh, 
It can be edgy, it can be shocking, it can be, can be good for, especially for, for a political statement or social, social change. But I like art that, that speaks to the soul and, and calms you down. I have a question that I'm, I'm looking at. I have some of your pictures in uh -huh. front of me. I'm looking at uh, the one that we have here with the woman on the prairie with a, uh, uh, is, it, is that a shotgun? I don't know my guns very <laughs> no. well. Rifle. A rifle musket shotgun. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but is there a, uh, what's the underlying story well, there? Well, yes, um, we live at the end of the Bozeman Trail, and you can see it etched in the mountain. And I, I think of the people that made that journey out there, and they brought with them uh, weapons, even if they were old. Now, this woman should have a repeating rifle, but here she has an old flintlock. And uh, she is alone, and so you have to wonder, what happened to her husband? Where is her mm -hmm. family? But how tough would she have mm -hmm. to be to make that journey? Um, we brought her out one night, just moments before the sun went down, so I could capture the light on her. And she didn't know anything about the rifle. She put the rear end, the end of it in the mud, and I had to yell for my wife, Liz, you know, show her how to hold the rifle. Um, but uh, um, so th that's it. The, the other part of that is uh, I did martial arts for 20 years in my life. And when I was doing Japanese karate for 17 years, I, was always, I always had one eye on the few women that would survive that through through the years, and, and some of the men would drive them into the corner and make them fight their way out. And I couldn't believe how resilient and tough these women were. And that's always in the back of my mind when I, I paint a woman, and, and that's been a bit of a theme for me. So Carly, I, Nadia got us off in a, a good direction where I think uh, we maybe want to take a look and have the audience take a look at a number of your paintings, images of your paintings. And um, maybe you could just go through and uh, give us a little story behind each of the paintings and maybe a little anecdote about uh, maybe what inspired you or who the person is or mm -hmm. what it means or what have you. So why don't you just take it away here for the next few minutes and talk about your paintings. Well, my, my new friend here is pointing to the next <laughs> one. Th that's Jerry Sharp. Now, he's a great young rodeo star. And our Ennis Rodeo out in the West is is very popular. And, and when it starts, I... Uh, leave my wife in the stands and I sneak back behind where the cowboys are on the ground with their saddles and they're stretching like uh, ballerinas and they're going through the moves and they have their shirts off and they're taping their whole bodies and some of them are praying. Um, and so that's where uh, Jerry Sharp, now I've seen his photograph in the hospital, terribly broken up, mm -hmm. and yet uh, he's the kind of kid that comes back and, and, and rides. So. Um, that's, that's what that is about. Oh, the next one you're pointing to is uh, Santa Claus. I've done, uh, I have painted a painting for our Christmas card, I think the last 15 to 20 years. Now, most of them were religious. And when I do a religious one, um, it's almost like a prayer. It's almost like an exercise, an adoration. But this particular one was fun. I, here's a, a Santa. He's back in a chair, and here's Rudolph lying next to him. There's <laughs> <laughs> redness to the <laughs> yeah. And I did this, and my wife Liz came home, and I said, Liz, what do you think of this? I said, I don't have a name for it. And she said, I do. December 26th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story on that. Can I also, the next one, you have captured the inner soul of this child. Mm. The eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just That's absolutely all. beautiful. Well, yes. um, I, I've said before, children are a resting place for innocence mm. in this world. I and like that. She is wearing her first jingle dress. And uh, the jingle dress, I think, goes back for 60, 70 years. I'm not sure. But um, uh, they used to be tobacco tops that were formed into a cone, and now they can simply buy them. Um, and when all the women wear them and the way they dance, they make a sound. And, and that sound is, I, I think, to uh, help with healing uh, for their whole community. It's a beautiful thing to see. Okay, well that is one of my Irish or Scottish pieces. That is Eileen Donan in the Highlands of Scotland. And my wife uh, had someone make me a big handmade kilt with a family tartan. 
And when I researched this beautiful castle, going back 400 years, my family clan, along with the MacDonald clan, attacked and sacked that, that castle. So <laughs> it's kind of fun. Now, when I was painting that, what I was learning, uh, a good painter came by and, and uh, helped me notice that sometimes reflections, lights are darker in the reflection and darks are lighter. And I thought that was interesting. I painted that castle twice. I've painted other Irish scenes. And uh, I'm very proud of my Irish and Scottish heritage. You're t yeah, you should be. I'm a McDonald. You are? Yes. Oh, wonderful. We're related. Yes, Grandma, we related. Grandma Mulligan. Don't forget I that. I thought I okay. saw a warrior in you. <laughs> <laughs> and then number six is a, a beautiful Indian woman. Mm -hmm. Oh, I could talk about this for half an hour. That's Kelly. She's the daughter of a good friend of ours. She got her Anishinaabe name in a ceremony a few years ago in Wisconsin. And here, this was one of my early native paintings. And um, I, I border on the side of romantic, and I'm a, a sentimentalist. And here, as you can see, I put the trees in kind of an architectural form around her, as if that was her church. Mm. And uh, well, but uh, this, is, this brings up a topic that I'd like to talk about. Um, in what it's like to have a, a person that's not of your culture or heritage depicting you. And there was a, a, a Native woman that, that warned me about being, uh, the, uh, knowing the difference between culture appreciation and culture appropriation. And uh, I was with a friend of mine who's Native and she's an artist and she stepped in front of me and the two of them argued and she was defending me. And I just well, took a step back and listened to everything they said. And since that, year, years ago, I've been very sensitive about it. And uh, a few years ago, Clyde Bellacourt saw my work at a powwow in Elk River and asked me to show my work at his powwow downtown Minneapolis. He was co-hosting it with a friend of mine, Steve Blake, who p passed away. But we set up our work there and they came over and they brought their friend, Floyd Red Crow Westerman. Uh, you might remember him as the old chief with the white hair in the movie Dances with Wolves. So when he came over, I held my breath, and he looked at everything I did, and then he gave me a big nod and a handshake, and I let my breath out. <laughs> um, since then, when I've been with elders of different tribes, I've often said, would you please look at my work and, and tell me what you think? Am I on the right path? And uh, I, I've... I've been okay so far. If I had offended people by it, I would stop. But I, my aim is only to honor them. I respect them so much and their culture. Yes. You have another young woman uh, for, uh, painting that's quite different than some mm -hmm. of your others. Mm -hmm. Th this woman is uh, 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 Rinaldo Benaldi. I think her name is Reina. Uh, I, if I get her name correctly. But she was a tremendous actress. She was in a play we saw where the runaway slaves were on one side of the stage and on the other side of the stage were young Jewish kids trying to escape the Nazis. Mm. And uh, anyway, uh, she laid down and sang a song and just captured my heart. I had to meet her afterwards and I wanted to paint her. She's off now to New York City and I think someday she'll be a great actress. Anyway, she, she came over and received her copy of it, and she was quite happy with it. Um, I like the composition, and you can see I threw in a little bit of architecture there. Mm -hmm. And I love doing uh, fabric. And one of my er teachers had warned me, be careful, because um, that can be too distracting. You decide what the person looks at first, second, and third. And, uh, so, <laughs> and yet, with that advice, I still love doing fabric. What's great about being an artist is breaking rules and going where nobody's gone before. Well, Ed, you know, uh, uh, with any art, whether it's piano or martial arts or painting, you learn the basics, you learn the fundamentals, the scales. If you were before then, you can innovate a little bit. There's an term in acting, you prepare and let go. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. all about energy and love. Mm -hmm. Talent is interest plus practice. Yes, and talent is unique. We, but, but Ed, I, I don't think it's uh, innate or just God-given. I think uh, I met kids who didn't know their right foot from left foot, but um, with practice, hand-eye coordination can, can happen. 
Yes. It's just it's just work. Yes. This, the mountain lion is <laughs> fabulous. Thank you. I, I got a compliment on that from a great wildlife artist, Daniel Smith, and that just really made my day. Um, Liz and I saw a mountain lion walking down a creek down near Oatana in the rain, and the hair stood up on our arms. And I called the DNR. They called back uh, a week later, and we talked for an hour. And at the end, they said, we think you saw a real mountain lion. They get 50 calls in Minnesota a year. 25 of them are pets that have gotten away. Mm. I said, how do you know that? They said, well, they've had work done on them, teeth or something. But um, they come from the west into Minnesota looking for mates. And when they cross over the border to Minnesota, the DNR refers to them as pioneers. So that one is named Pioneer. Um. I would have lost money betting that that was from Bozeman, not from Owatonna. <laughs> it, it happens. And there's a uh, painting of a lovely woman with a handsome dog. Right. That's just a photograph of my wife outside in front. Um, she's the love of my life. She's a uh, uh, comforter in chief. She supports me, encourages me. Um, she is the most giving person I've ever met. She looked at me the other night uh, and uh, said, you're not getting anything for Christmas. <laughs> and I said, what? And then we burst l into l laughing because I know how much time and money she gives to all of her ch charitable organizations. She propels me into art shows. She's my manager. She tells people what I meant to say. And uh, <laughs> she's just a gorgeous woman. On that, on that note, well, we're almost out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, any closing thoughts, Carly? Um, we've got about 45 seconds. Well, sure. Um, when I think about finding a passion in the third act of my life, and hopefully maybe even in the fourth act, uh, what comes to mind is what uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said about age and opportunity. And he wrote, as the evening twilight fades away, the sky is filled with stars that are um, invisible by day. So look forward to the future. There's much more to come. And on that note, uh, I'd like to thank our guest, Carlton McCambridge, my co-host. And um, that's all for this episode. We'll see you next time on Generations. Thank you.